Asterix and the Indomitable audio series. Welcome to it. My name is Alan, hoping that you're doing well. Whenever you're listening to this, wherever you may be in the world right now, it has been a while since we've done any Asterix audio. It's been a couple of months actually. This would have come out last month, but I was offline for most of September because on the 1st of September, local prices went up and there just wasn't enough money to buy some data so I was, I was offline came back a couple of weeks ago so now just trying to get back on track and while I'm online again I'm trying to reach out to my subscribers anyone who's been following the content that I put out on my channels on the internet archive just to let them know what has happened and also to try and encourage people to consider becoming regular supporters because if prices were to go up again maybe in a couple of months or next year at least if I had the you know the supporters backing me there would have been some you know some money available to buy data and to, to continue so I'm just hoping at least if I can you know, get some more supporters that will at least cover uh, the internet side of things so that I won't have to go offline again so if you haven't considered please check the description all the links are there my contact details are there as well so have a look at those if you have any questions just drop me an email and let me know what you think so this episode we're looking at book 3 of Asterix, which is Asterix and the Goths. Now this one, I'm curious to find out what people think about this one because on one hand, this is, I would say, the first standard Asterix adventure where we have Asterix and Obelix and later on Dogmatics. They leave the village, they leave Gaul and they travel to another country and they encounter you know some memorable characters maybe make some friends along the way or maybe meet a relative um, but on the other hand as far as this book is concerned there is a political influence just underneath the story um, this is mainly based on the time when this book came out this was in 19 in the early 1960s and if you know your history this was um, almost 20 years after world war ii so you can try and imagine you know a lot of countries were recovering from world war ii and asterix and uh, the the asterix comic being french you can also try and imagine what uh, the atmosphere was like back then as far as France was concerned so I'm just curious to find out what you think about this one I don't know if it makes any you know top 5 top 10 lists for people of um, their favorite Asterix books um, because of you know the political influence but we'll see as we get through it so this book, as we know, it was written by René Cossini and illustrated by Albert Uderzo. It was first serialized in the French and Belgian comics magazine, Pilot, from issue 82 to issue 122. This was between 1961 and 1962. And then it would be published as a volume in 1963. The English translation was done by the team of Anthea Bell and Derek Hawkridge. It was published by Brockhampton Press in 1975. So like with any Asterix adventure, the year is 50 BC. All of Gaul is occupied by the Romans. Well, all but one small village of indomitable Gauls were held out against invaders. This small village however is surrounded by four fortified camps aquarium totorum 
Laudanum and Compendium. So the story begins in the Goldish village. It's a peaceful day. Everyone is going about their usual business as the druid Getafix prepares to leave for the forest of the Canuts, where the annual druid conference takes place. If you recall, we first found out about the forest of the Canuts in the previous episode when we looked at book two, Asterix and the Golden Sickle, because Getafix needed a new Golden Sickle. He couldn't attend this conference without one. So Asterix and Obelix, they traveled to Leticia to meet um, Metallurgix, a relative of Obelix, hoping to get a new Golden Sickle for, for Getafix. So not only does uh, this conference offer a chance for Druids to catch up, with old friends, but there's a contest that's held there to determine the druid of the year. So you see Asterix is with Getafix, and Asterix is telling him that he's worried about the druid traveling to this conference uh, by himself. So Asterix offers to accompany Getafix to the forest of the Canuts, and uh, Getafix has to tell him that only druids are allowed in the forest. So Asterix says, okay, I'll accompany you to the edge of the forest and I'll wait for you there, which is fine for Getafix. Then not wanting to be left behind, we see Obelix. He comes along and he says, well, uh, it's, it's not the season for many years, so you can come along. So now we've got our traveling trio and the villagers, they gather around and they see them off. Uh, Cacophonix. You know, the man with the gold voice, he shows up. He wants to sing them a farewell song, but nobody appreciates Cacophonix, so uh, he's shut down immediately. So while the Gauls are leaving, we shift over to the eastern side of Gaul, where uh, we see a pair of legionaries who are on guard duty. We have uh, Arteriosclerosis and Gastroenteritis. Those are your two legionaries. They, um, as they're approaching the, the edge of the frontier, someone speaks in Gothic from a nearby bush. And uh, Arteriosclerosis, he hears that voice. But Gastroenteritis doesn't believe him. He doesn't think uh, Goths would dare enter Roman territory. But uh, to the surprise of these two legionaries, some Goths have entered Roman territory, and uh, four uh, warriors, they jump out of the bush, they attack the legionaries, and then they tie them up. These four warriors, it's Tataric, Atmospheric, Prehistoric, and Esoteric, and they are accompanied by their chief, Choleric. So now that they've, you know, uh, tied up these legionaries, they set off for their real destination, the Forest of the Carnets. Now, just a quick uh, history lesson. The Goths, they were one of the Teutonic people. These were the ancient uh, Germanic people who originated from Jutland, J-U-T-L-A-N-D, Jutland, which is uh, southern Scandinavia and uh, northern Germany. Um, and uh, southern Gaul. Uh, no, actually, southern Scandinavia and uh, northern Germany, and they traveled to, to Gaul. Um, they had a major role in the end of the Western Roman Empire. This was between the 3rd and 5th uh, centuries. I'll try and find some links, and I'll put them in the show notes, uh, just so you can read a bit more about the, the Goths. And uh, what's interesting about this, this scene that we've just had, as a reader, depending on uh, which language of the comic you're reading, everyone is speaking the same language. But in the world of the, the story, the moment you have a character show up who speaks um, with a different font for, his, for their dialogue, they are complete, they're talking in a completely different language to another character. So that's what we see here uh, between the two legionaries. Their font is the same. The 
the gods may show up if you ever look at the, the, the dialogue the speech bubble the font in there it's in the gothic font completely different lamps I just thought because it was a nice little uh, thing to show there same language the readers completely different to the, to the characters in the story so we go back to the trio of goals they are still on the road to the forest of the Karnuts the trip has been uneventful so far uh, little do they know what has happened until Getafix sees someone just up ahead it's his old friend the British Druid value added tax nice name so as the two druids catch up they encounter a Roman patrol that comes along it's being led by a decurion Obelix is ready to fight them but Getafix has to has to stop him and he tells him that uh, you know while the druid conference is happening a truce, a truce has been signed with the Romans so Getafix says to the decurion that they are the ju they're just druids on their way to the forest but the decurion wants them to prove that they're druids so Getafix is about to open his bag to get his things but value added tax he offers to take care of this and so he asks the decurion for a volunteer the decurion chooses a legionary who's named Cadaverous and Cadaverous he steps forward value added tax he fishes out some herbs from his bag gives them to Cadaverous Cadaverous eats the herbs nothing happens at first there's no magic as far as the decurion can see until he orders Cadaverous to say something and next thing you know the legionary he starts braying like a donkey which the ghouls they find completely hilarious but the, the, the joke is the decurion once he hears uh, Cadaverous he just says ah, yes. there's no difference between this and Cadaverous is normal speaking but he's been convinced okay these are druids so he lets the group proceed but he tells them that Romans are patrolling the area because some goths have crossed over into Gaul and they've been spotted in this area so the Gauls have been given their first hint about the goths the group uh, finally reaches the edge of the forest of the Carnutes Getafix and Value Editex they proceed into the forest while Asterix and Obelix they camp just outside the entrance as for the, the Goths where are they anyway? well they are not too far away from the forest of the Carnutes they are hiding in some bushes as uh, their chief uh, Choleric goes over their big plan the main reason why they have traveled to this place they are here to kidnap the druid who wins the contest once they've got the druid they'll take him back across the border in Yen and then use his magic to help the gods attack Gaul and Rome so once uh, Chief Choleric has laid out that plan they then sneak into the forest to watch the conference so in the forest, the druids, they, they have gathered and the conference begins without any trouble and we see them you know, cutting mistletoe they're sharing notes about their tools and spells and then to cap it off they have a great banquet so after the banquet, it's time for the contest and the druids, they get their cauldrons out and they prepare their magic potions while the goths are watching nearby the first druid to show off his skills is botanics he pours a few drops of his magic potion onto the ground and from that spot grows a bouquet of out of season flowers and this is so impressive uh, that even one of the gods he stands up and he starts giving an, an applause until uh, chief choleric has to silence this guy although this guy you know he just says oh, I just like flowers so he just wanted to show his appreciation the second trait Drafix he throws some powder into the air and it begins to rain the rainmaker there the third trait 
suffix. He says he has created a way to make powdered soup, which can be carried in small packets. Uh, suffix. Um, no, yeah, as he says this, the chief druid he reminds suffix that in order to make uh, the soup, you'll still need a cauldron. And suffix tells the chief, oh, no problem. He just so happens to have made a way to make powdered cauldrons. So, instant soup and instant cauldrons. Suffix. Fourth druid is value added tax. He has made a potion that grants the drinker immunity from pain. So he drinks the potion and he uses his bare hands to pick up some chips from a pot of boiling oil. So nice little nod to the British there. Chips. Then the fifth and final druid is Getafix. And of course he has a brood is signature magic potion. There's a very old druid who's there and he comes forward to, to have a taste of this. And once he has a taste, Getafix tells the druid to uproot a nearby oak tree. The druid goes there, he proceeds to lift the tree without any problem, except for the couple of druids who've been in the tree, you know, cutting mistletoe. So they are the only two who are upset, but everyone else is impressed uh, by Getafix and he's declared the winner. Choleric, who has been watching this with his men, they found the druid that they are looking for. So the chief uh, druid, he presents Getafix with the trophy, it's a golden menu, and the conference draws to a close with everyone cheering for Getafix. As the druids are leaving, Valia attacks, he says to Getafix that they can leave together. It's no problem for Getafix just has to get his things first. So as he goes to, to collect his things, Getafix is jumped by those goths. They throw him in a sack, they tie it up, and then they make their exit. Meanwhile, Valia the Tex has been waiting for Getafix, doesn't know what has happened, he's wondering where his friend has gone. Outside the forest, Asterix and Obelix, they see the other druids coming out of the forest, but there's no sign of Getafix. So now Asterix is worried about the druid. So he suggests that he and Obelix go into the forest to find Getafix. Once in the forest, they meet up with Value at the Tax who doesn't know what has happened to Getafix. He just disappeared. So the three of them, they go in the direction that Getafix went. And Asterix finds a physical helmet. And already that's a red flag. That's bad news for value added tax. But Asterix, he assures him that he and Obelix will find the druid. Um, they haven't lost any hope yet. So he asks value added tax to show him the cauldron that Getafix brewed the magic potion in. They find the cauldron. Asterix has a drink before the ghouls exit the forest and um, head for the eastern border. Valia detects he offers to go with them, but Asterix says they can manage on their own. So as they are walking, Asterix uh, gets a chance to explain to Obelix about the two major groups of Goths. You can check the description, I will put some links in there to dive further about these two different groups of uh, the Goths. You have the Visigoths, they are a western group. The Visigoths, they are known for invading Rome um, at some point, and then they would establish a kingdom in present day Spain, southern France. And then you've got the eastern group known as the Ostrogoths. They would uh, establish a kingdom in northern Italy around 500 BC, uh, AD. So the Goths, eventually, they are found by the Gauls, I should say. They are found by another Roman patrol who are also searching for the Goths. That Curion, he sees the helmet that Asterix has picked up from the forest 
and he assumes that he and Obelix are the gods that they're looking for. And unfortunately for the Romans, when they attack Asterix and Obelix, they are the ones who are sent flying. And so it's thanks to this encounter that Asterix, he starts becoming concerned about the Romans um, targeting him and, and Obelix, you know, mistaking them to be gods. Meanwhile, though, at a nearby Roman camp, we are introduced to General Cantankerous. He's really worried about the Goths being out um, in Roman territory. You know, he's worried that if Julius Caesar were to find out about this, this general, his men, they'll be in serious trouble and they'll be sent to the circus. So, as he's worried about this, the patrol, which uh, met Asterix and Obelix, they returned to the camp, uh, you know, beaten up and battered, and the decurion, he makes a report to the general about meeting the quote-unquote horde of barbarians. So he draws a basic sketch of uh, what he believes are the gods. Instead, he draws sketches of Asterix and Obelix. And so Cantankerous, once he sees this, he orders for copies of these sketches to be made and to be sent to the other camps. And so right away, messengers are dispatched in all directions. Meanwhile, Obelix, he uh, notices that, you know, someone is coming their way. So he and Asterix, they climb up a tree. And while they are there, they see that um, one of the messengers is coming down the path. So they decide to put an end, uh, you know, to uh, this run. You know, Obelix just jumps down from the tree and he lands on this messenger while Asterix he picks up what uh, the messenger was, was carrying. It's a copy of that sketch. And it becomes clear to him now that the goals are being searched for by the Romans, which means that the real gods will be left alone. And that's exactly what happens because the, the gods, we see them, they are hurrying through the forest, uh, unmolested, no one is bothering them, while in the background, you see several legionaries, you know, scouring the area looking for, quote-unquote, the gods. So Asterix has an idea. He and Obelix, they should disguise themselves as Roman, uh, as Romans. And lucky for them, because of the big search that's going on, there are plenty of Romans um, for them to pick from. Um, so they just have to wait for the right legionaries to show up. Uh, specifically, a small legionary and a medium-sized legionary. Not a fat legionary, a medium-sized one for Obelix. And eventually, they find a pair, they ambush them and they borrow the, the soldiers' uniforms before gagging and tying up the soldiers and leaving. No one will suspect that these two are in disguise, considering that all the soldiers are clean-shaven, but you've got Asterix and Obelix with full moustaches. They won't be suspected at all. So now we have legionary Asterix and his friend legionary Obelix. And sure enough, Soon enough, they meet another pair of legionaries who ask them if they've seen the two quote-unquote goths. But uh, Obelix, you know, he's having a great time being in disguise. He just starts laughing and he, you know, he can't help himself. And Asterix has to apologize for his friend and they, they have to hurry along before, you know, things get out of hand. And these two legionaries, you know, surprised um, by the two that they've met. One of them even comments that those two, why are they not clean shaven? They'll get into trouble because of that. So after that, they go on to meet the uh, two legionaries who were left tied up by Asterix and Obelix. And these two uh, legionaries, they think that the tied up legionaries are Visigoths who were captured by another soldier who has gone off to get reinforcements. So uh, these two uh, legionaries, they decide to help themselves and they take 
uh, the tied up soldiers back to camp to collect a reward. What could go wrong? So back at the camp, the uh, tied up legionaries are delivered to General Cantangras um, and you know his mood is uh, shifted, he's pleased to see that uh, the Goths, quote unquote, have been captured at last until the um, the two legionaries are unbound and the truth comes out. These two legionaries are Marcus Ubiquitus and Julius uh, Monotonous of the third cohort. They report that they were attacked by a pair of ghouls who then took their uniforms. And so much for Cantankerous being in a good mood. That's bad news for him. And he angrily orders uh, the other two legionaries to send out information about the ghouls who are disguised as Roman soldiers. And what you end up getting is soldiers suspecting each other now because anybody, any one of these soldiers could be the ghouls in disguise. So people are suspecting each other and it's just chaos everywhere now. While well, that's going on, Asterix and Obelix, they continue on their journey. Um, they have decided, yeah, there's no point in dressing up as legionaries now. They, while, well, um, as they are continuing their journey, uh, the Goths, they have crossed over from Gaul back to their country of uh, Germania. No trouble at the Gaul border uh, because there's, a, there's one legionary there the gods they just run through him and what you get is the beginning of a running gag which um, goes on throughout the story where this legionary by the, the border he gets attacked by the gods as they're crossing over and then he goes back to his camp to report this to his superior telling him oh some gods they have just crossed over into Germania they're invading Germania and of course his superior doesn't believe him and he punishes this guy. So this is where this running gag begins. Over on the Germanian side, the Goths, they are stopped by an Ostrogoth customs officer who points out that the uh, this group is importing quote-unquote foreign goods, which Choleric says, okay, that was the main point of their journey, you know, to pick up this druid. But uh, the officer is not going to let them through. He says that they have to speak to his superior. And what you get is Choleric and his group, they meet with the superior and they beat him up. And then they proceed. Meanwhile, Asterix and Obelix, they reach the border. They cross over into Germania. Again, with that running gag, where this time the legionary reports to his superior that, oh, some ghouls, they've crossed over from Gaul to Germania. They're invading Germania. Again, his superior doesn't believe him, and he punishes this guy for a second time. So now, Choleric and his men, they have returned to their hometown, and they meet with their chief, Metric, to deliver Getavix. And uh, Chief Metric he is pleased, and he orders for Getavix to be placed in a cage for... Uh, interrogation later. Asterix and Obelix, now in Germania, they meet a band of Goths um, and the leader asks them who they are. But of course there's a language barrier which is made worse by Obelix because he chooses this moment to um, revert back to being legionary Obelix and he you know, does the Roman salute and he, you know, introduces his friend, and the Goths who are watching this, they think these, uh, the Goths are invading Romans, and so they attack Asterix and Obelix, and that doesn't end very well for the Goths. And so Asterix has to explain to Obelix that uh, they don't need to disguise themselves as Romans, instead they should dress up as Goths. So they hide in some bushes, they wait for the right gods to come along, then they borrow um, clothes from these two gods. And since they don't speak the language, Asterix advises Obelix that they should just stay silent. 
while they are on foreign uh, soil. We shift back to the palace of Chief Metric. Um, we're in the room where Ketafix is in a cage. A guard arrives and he tells Metric that um, an interpreter has arrived. This interpreter is named Rhetoric. He's this uh, short, bald man, crafty looking fellow. Uh, Metric, he makes it clear to Rhetoric that if Getafix does not agree to Metric's demand, uh, Rhetoric will be killed alongside the druid. So Metric, um, he wants to know if Getafix is ready to use his magic powers. Uh, Rhetoric, he asks the druid and Getafix, he declines. And so Rhetoric ends up translating what Getafix says um, to, to Metric as, as if Getafix had said, perhaps. Uh, but that won't do for Metric. He wants either a yes or a no from Getafix. Um, Getafix he tells Rhetoric that no, his answer is no. But Rhetoric, he translates this um, as a yes. And then he adds that uh, Getafix will show his magic powers um, in a week's time when there's a full moon. But for Rhetoric, he is mainly buying himself some time. So this is our interpreter, Rhetoric. Meanwhile, Asterix and Obelix, um, they have not figured out um, how they're going to find Getafix. So as they are, as they are going along, they meet a, they find a marching troop of soldiers and Asterix, he thinks, okay, it might be a good idea to join um, this troop and follow them back um, to wherever they are going. So this troop, they arrive in town and just as the ghouls are trying to break away from the troop, the officer in charge, he spots them. And so now Asterix and Obelix, they have to stay with the soldiers and march with them back to the army barracks. And Asterix says they'll have to try escaping at night because uh, in the meantime, they'll have to blend in as best as they can. So while they are there at the barracks, they are ordered to sweep around and then join the other soldiers for a parade and inspection. And then finally at night, after supper, unfortunately for Obelix, they are not given any boar. Instead, it's a supper of cabbage. So after supper, they make their escape. And unfortunately, they are spotted by a night patrol that is escorting the interpreter, Rhetoric, back to the army barracks turns out he was on his way out of town hoping to flee to go and maybe get a job there since he can you know, speak multiple languages but he got caught so the goals and rhetoric they are taken back to the army barracks they are locked up in a guard room together and as for Asterix he you know, he's had enough of this he wants to leave and the uh, Oblix he asks him about rhetoric. Meanwhile, rhetoric, um, he thinks that the goals are spies. And so he starts planning that, oh, I should capture these and uh, I, can, I can save myself. And uh, Asterix, uh, he decides they'll tie up rhetoric and uh, they'll take him along. Maybe he can be useful. And that's fine for rhetoric. It's going according to his plan. So the trio, they make it out of the barracks with nobody seeing them. They hurry out of town, they head back into the forest. So at first, it seems to Asterix that Rhetoric doesn't speak Kolish because Asterix asks him if he knows where Getafix is and Rhetoric, he answers in Gothic. Um, but then Rhetoric, he suddenly sneezes. Um, Asterix, he says, bless you, and this is when Rhetoric thanks him in Gaulish. So now, um, Asterix and Oblix have figured out that how he can understand them. And so now he starts protesting, and Oblix has to threaten to beat him up for Rhetoric to cooperate um, with them. So 
then he tells the ghouls uh, what has happened to Getafix. So now after that, the three of them they head back into town and they find that um, there are patrols everywhere now. So what Victoria ends up doing, he draws attention um, of the soldiers by shouting that he's caught a pair of uh, goldish spies. The soldiers, they hear this, they see the trio and they chase after them. The ghouls, the Toric, they flee into a, a dead end alley. Now, just outside the, the alley, there is a sign which says no through, no through road. But because Asterix can't read Gothic, they just run past the sign and they end up in this alley. The soldiers, they catch up with them, they try to attack Asterix and Obelix and they just end up getting beaten up. Except for one soldier, um, he's okay and Asterix, he says, oh, maybe that soldier, he can take the goals to their chief. So what Asterix and Obelix end up doing is they surrender um, to this soldier. This is our saying that... Um, their political um, influences underneath the story. This particular point where Asterix and Obelix, if you know your, your World War II history, the French, they are you know, well known for you know, surrendering during the, the war. So this is what we get here, Asterix and Obelix surrendering to this uh, Gothic soldier. So just before the goals, the Toric and the soldier meet uh, Metric back at his palace. We see Metric is talking to Getafix, saying that he's looking forward to seeing the druid use his magic. But what Metric is unaware of is that Getafix, he can speak Gothic very well, um, albeit with a slight Gaulish accent, but he can speak the language, he can understand. Um, interesting uh, plot twist there. So then we get Asterix, Obelix, Rhetoric and the soldier, they enter the room. Uh, Rhetoric and the soldier, they start, they are, uh, you know, they're fighting over which of them, um, you know, should get credit for capturing the Goldish, Goldish spies. But meanwhile, Asterix and uh, Obelix, they hurry over to reunite with, uh, with Getafix. And then Rhetoric, he, you know, starts begging Getafix to say that he'll show his magic for a chief metric. But Getafix, again, he refuses. And so Rhetoric, he ends up uh, translating this as if Getafix has agreed uh, to show his, ma his magic to metric. Only for Getafix to speak up now in Gothic and reveal that Rhetoric has been lying to metric this whole time. Getafix had no intention of showing his magic at all. Um, and this comes as a big surprise to, to Rhetoric. You know, he's shocked to hear that oh, Getafix can speak Gothic. But as for Chief Metric, he's very upset now and he just orders for the lot of them to be thrown in the dungeons. To all be executed the next day. So in the dungeons, Rhetoric is now upset about the whole situation, blaming the ghouls for his misfortune. So it reaches a point where Obelix has to, you know, clonk him on the head just to um, to stop his whining. And then Getafix, he has his chance now to share a plan that he's got. So while the ghouls are, you know, still here among the gods, Getafix says they should stir up some trouble. You know, and cause some chaos and some disorder in order to discourage the gods from thinking of invading Gaul. And so now he also thinks that rhetoric could play a part in uh, this plan. So Getafix tells Obelix to wake uh, rhetoric up and then Getafix says to him that um, he's willing to show rhetoric some of his magic powers and make him the strongest among all the gods. So at first Rhetoric uh, is not too sure about this but Asterix assures him that the druid isn't joking. 
and so rhetoric is ready for the magic. But first, Getafix says he needs some ingredients. And so the goal of the guard who is uh, patrolling outside is called. And um, uh, Getafix, he tells the guard uh, he needs um, some ingredients. So he gives the guard a list of ingredients for one last meal of uh, quote-unquote godish soup. So the guard, he heads back to uh, Matrix's room to present the list. Matrix has no problem with the list because, you know, the prisoners have to be in top form for tomorrow's big event. So he approves uh, the ingredients and the prisoners getting one last meal. So Matrix, in, uh, while he's in his room, he's listening to uh, his entertainment manager giving him a rundown of the program for tomorrow's uh, festivities. So he says to kick things off, yeah, the manager he suggests that the prisoners could be torn apart by wild horses. Metric approves this. It may not be, you know, something new or fresh, but it will be a hit with the audience. Then the manager proposes that, uh, you know, whatever remains of the prisoners after they've been torn apart, that can be chopped into, into tiny pieces. But Metric doesn't think that this would be a good idea, saying that other pieces would be too small for the audience to see. So, uh, scratch that plan. Just have them be torn apart by wild horses. So the ingredients now have been delivered. Getafix gets to work brewing the magic potion, Obelix, here we get Obelix, you know, he wants his share of the magic potion, but as usual, he is reminded that he cannot have any magic potion, because he fell into a cauldron of magic potion when he was a baby, thus the effect of the magic potion on Obelix is permanent, but of course it doesn't stop Obelix from, you know, sulking, you know, he turns over to the side, he's got his hands in his pocket, he's, you know, saying it's not fair. But, again, he has to be reminded, he's already had his magic potion. So once the magic potion is ready, rhetoric, he receives some, while Obelix, uh, not Obelix, Asterix, he's left to drink the rest of the magic potion from the cauldron. He's going to need it. At first, rhetoric says he doesn't feel any different. And then Getafix he says, why don't you test your strength on the cell door? So Rhetoric goes over to the door and he easily breaks through the door. And this delights him. He believes himself to be strong enough to take on anybody, whether it's other Goths, the Gauls, even the Romans. But Asterix, he says to Rhetoric, just wait until um, the time of the execution before he, he acts. So rhetoric, he agrees to this. So the next day, a team of uh, guards, they descend into the dungeons to get the prisoners. And they are surprised to find that the prisoners, especially rhetoric, is eager to go out. Um, he's excited even though they are going out to be executed. But he's ready to go. They make it out of the, uh, the dungeons and they make it outside into a open air arena which is full of uh, full of people who are anticipating a big show the crowd is there cheering they're excited and uh, the prisoners they make it up to the platform where metric is seated and rhetoric he proudly announces that oh i'll be the first one to go so rhetor uh, metric he orders for the wild horses to be brought and soon afterwards Metric is tied to the horses and the horses they try to move forward trying to pull this prisoner apart but rhetoric is too strong for them, is too powerful even Metric is shocked by this display so he orders the horse trainer to untie Metric and get wilder horses so Metric is, is untied and uh, as the horse trainer is talking to him, Metric just simply punches this guy 
was sending him flying before he leaps onto the platform where metric is seated and then rhetoric he just throws metric to the ground and he declares himself the new chief of the gods it's all thanks to the druids magic powers and the audience they have no sympathy for metric whatsoever and they just start shouting down with metric don't live rhetoric the first and you have asterix and obelix just by the side applauding uh rhetoric metric is not happy about this he is the chief around here but rhetoric you know he just orders for metric to be thrown in the dungeons there's a new chief in town a short while later uh, asterix and obelix get a fix they enter the palace's room to meet the new chief rhetoric he hasn't forgotten them and he welcomes them in so asterix he says they have a favor to ask of him they want to visit metric in the dungeons to make fun of him rhetoric no problem with this he allows the ghouls to do so but then once the ghouls have left for the dungeons this is where rhetoric shows his true colors and he tells the entertainment manager that after the goals are no longer useful to him rhetoric will uh, get will have them gotten rid of and this is where you have the manager you know suggesting that oh maybe the goals can be placed in a pressure cooker and be cooked for you know in a few minutes again another reference so um in the dungeons the goals they find metric he is you know wrapped up in chains get up he asks him if he wants to take revenge on rhetoric and become chief again so he gives uh, matrix a magic potion and the former chief breaks out of those chains storms out of the dungeons you know leaving a trail of guards in his of knocked out guards in his wake from the throne room um, his voice can be heard and rhetoric he orders his guard to investigate the guard heads out only to be sent back flying into the throne room by metric who enters the room and he starts fighting with rhetoric and uh asterix get a fix and obelisk they're just outside the throne room watching and asterix he says oh, well those two will just keep fighting and with neither of them winning since both of them have had some magic potion and sure enough their battle carries on for over two hours and metric he decides to leave he's going to build up uh, his own army rhetoric he also decides to build up his own army and meanwhile asterix he says well, they might as well continue with their plan for spreading disorder and confusion so they exit the palace and they are back out on the streets and they see you know there's a man sweeping uh, getafix asks for his name this man is named electric and he's not happy with his life you know being poor he is powerless and so getafix decides to help him gives electric some magic potion and with this newfound strength electric is ready to throw or to overthrow the government and uh, lead his own army as general electric and so he goes off to do that the next man that the ghouls meet is out shopping for his wife gets a magic potion and eventually they the ghouls they meet up with more townspeople they give them magic potion and eventually you have four major factions emerging one for rhetoric one for metric one for electric and one for a man named euphoric and while this is going on asterix he asks getafix what will happen to the gods um, once the effect of the magic potion wears out and uh, getafix he just shrugs and he says uh, basically they will be equal to each other and uh, they'll just continue fighting each other for centuries not bothering to invade other countries uh, little does he know and so now with their work done the goals they begin their journey back to Gaul. and what we get is a summary 
of what is known as the Asterixian Wars. If you check the description, the show notes, I'll put a link showing uh, the page which has the summaries. Uh, it's really something you have to see. Um, so this summary goes through the history of some of the major battles that happened, starting with Rhetoric's victory over Metric. After that, we have Lyric, who was an ally of Rhetoric. He would defeat Rhetoric before Rhetoric um, got time to celebrate his victory. And then uh, Lyric would be defeated by his brother-in-law, Satiric, after being ambushed at what uh, Lyric thought uh, was a family reunion. Uh, Rhetoric would defeat uh, Lyric again, only to be defeated by Metric, when Metric's vanguard surprised Rhetoric's rearguard. And uh, this tactic employed by Metric is what's known today as the Metric system. Clever. And then Electric would defeat Euphoric, and while Electric uh, claimed victory, Rhetoric uh, would defeat Metric again, and then Euphoric would uh, also defeat Metric. Then Euphoric gets defeated by Eccentric, who loses to Lyric, who is beaten by Electric, who falls to Satiric, who gets defeated by Rhetoric, until Metric defeats Rhetoric again. That's your summary. It's better to see it. It's pretty well done. Very clever. So the Gauls, they return to their village, which looks deserted at first, until the villagers emerge and welcome their friends, uh, because uh, apparently the druid value added tax um, had told the villagers what had happened, and so the villagers, they thought that our three goals would never return. But now that they've returned, it's all good news and it's time for a celebration banquet. And this is how the adventure comes to an end. Of course, uh, Cacophonix, unfortunately not being able to, you know, celebrate with the goals, he's there by the side, tied up and gagged, but that's your adventure come to an end. That's book three, Asterix and the Gods. So, like I had said at the beginning of the episode, I wonder what people make of this story. Uh, I don't think it will make any, you know, top five or top ten uh, lists of uh, favorite Asterix adventures. I think it was just a story of its time, with some political commentary thrown in by. Um, the authors. Again, we had the story of the Goths, uh, you know, taking the, the Druid back to their country, the Gauls chasing after them to rescue their, uh, the Druid, and then while they're in Germania, causing some chaos, causing some trouble, with the idea that doing this might discourage the, the Goths from invading other countries because they'll be too busy fighting with each other. But, unfortunately, knowing our history, that didn't happen because World War II. So, I think because of the, you know, the politics, rather than being a standard adventure story that Asterix is known for, this uh, book might, uh, might be passed, might be skipped over by people and they just move on to follow the other adventures. Speaking of other adventures, the next book that we'll be looking at will be book four, Asterix, the Gladiator. Now, I haven't read that one in a while. I'm not sure if there's going to be any um, political commentary underneath it for that story, but it should be an interesting one. Maybe it's an interesting book for you, one of your favorites. So um, I'm interested to find out from you what you think about Asterix the Gladiator. If you have anything to share about it, you can, you can start reading it now. Then you can send in your feedback and let me know what you think. But also, um, 
curious to find out what you think about the book that we just looked at today, Asterix and the Goths. Uh, when was the last time you read it? What did you think about it back then? What do you think about it reading it now? What have you noticed? What were some of the things you might have forgotten that you've been reminded of now? Or something that you didn't know that you discovered when you read the story now? As far as trivia uh, notes are concerned, there are the two which uh, stood out for me. The first one would be referenced in The Complete Guide to Asterix, which was written by uh, Peter Kessler. He writes about uh, Gossini when he you know, came up with the competition in the Forest of the Carnage, the Druid competition. Gossini may have been inspired to come up with this competition by what uh, Julius Caesar mentioned in a book uh, that he wrote the, called The Gallic Wars. Uh, there were several books. Um, the book in particular that uh, inspired this was Book 6. So um, check the description, the show notes. I'll put a link to... Um, I think it's called Spark Notes. Hope I got it right. The website where you can read summaries of uh, various books. So there's a summary for that book, and uh, the particular line where Caesar mentions the Druids. I'm going to read it now. But if you want more uh, about that book, again check the check the link. So this is what it says. The Druids concerned themselves with all forms of worship and rites, and with settling disputes, judging crimes, and assigning penalties. Those people who refuse to accept their decisions are banned and given no legal protection. One Druid is chief among them, and once a year they all meet in the land of the Khanids, the center of Gaul, and all those wishing to study and in all Gallic disputes are treated. This man of rule originated in Britain, and those wishing to study its history go to Britain. Druids neither battle nor pay taxes. Although their lot sounds easy, some students spend 20 years in training, memorizing their law and in order to strengthen their powers of memory and to keep their knowledge secret from the general population. Perhaps their most important doctrine concerns the soul passing into another body when the body dies. For this reason, they are not afraid of dying. That was, uh, I guess, a summary of uh, what Julius Caesar had to say about the Druids. So this, this inspired Gossip. And then if you were to read the book, the, the comic, I should say, Asterix and the Gods, if you notice the helmets that the gods were wearing, they resembled the helmets which were worn by soldiers from World War I. And this was deliberate uh, by uh, Udrezo. And uh, he had to say that there's a comment that he uh, made, which is in the complete guide, and he says this. I decided to make the reference a bit more distant. A World War II helmet would have been too close. In France, it's an image people try to forget. We don't like to be reminded of our defeats. So that was a uh, his little reference, and you noticed the, the the shape of the helmets. So I think, as far as trivia and notes are concerned, those are the two which which stood out. Is uh, nothing else that came up except again the you know the political references that were in the story so that was that was book three we've come to the end of the episode if you have any feedback any comments about this book or the next one that we'll be looking at you can send all your feedback to asterix audio series at xmail.net that's asterix audio series at xmail.net. The address will be in the description. That's where you'll find it. 
and also in the description with uh, all my contact details there are support links as well if uh, you've been following uh, this series and would like to support it it's a paypal link it's a patreon link i still have to look into subscribe star hoping to sort that out and then i'll include that link as well among the support links i don't have any experience with uh, cryptocurrency so i haven't dived into cryptocurrency in case there are any of you who wanted to support via crypto so uh, i think just for the time being um fig, uh, if you can support via the other the links that have are provided do that instead crypto i'm not too sure so just set that on aside okay so thank you for listening we'll catch you in the next episode for asterix the gladiator for now enjoy your day enjoy your evening enjoy your afternoon take care